Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it was very, it affect, let's put it this way, it really affected me when it happened. One day my neighbor was fantastic. I mean, she couldn't do enough for you. She was out socializing, go, um, carrying on a normal life. And the next thing I knew, she had become a ward of the state and also she had caregivers around the clock. So what happened between the time when she was the life of the party and a ward of the state is something that I'm kind of dealing with. Where was I and why wasn't I tuned in? We all lead very busy lives. And to help us go through this, I've invited two women today to help explain what is our role in a neighborly way. And with me is Reva Magger and Sheila Warnock. Welcome, ladies. Thanks. Reva, why don't you just tell us a little bit about Durout, and then we can go in and start with the questions after Sheila finishes. Sure. Um, Durout was founded in 1976 by Columbia University students who saw the frail elderly becoming more isolated on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And we started with a few programs, and now we have more than 30 that are designed to enhance the lives of the elderly, reduce isolation, and also bring the generations together for their mutual benefit. Oh, how lovely. Sheila. Thank you for inviting me tonight. Um, I'm the founder and the president of Share the Caregiving, a nonprofit organization, and the co-author of a book called Share the Care, how to organize a group to care for someone seriously ill. Now, I didn't start out in the world in this type of work, I was actually a creative person, but it was my life experiences that brought me to caregiving and led to this book. Fabulous. How do you recognize someone who needs help while you're living a busy, hectic life working in your own life? The signs can be very subtle, actually, and unless you see that person on almost a daily basis, you may not recognize them. Somebody who has been very functional might stop going out. Somebody who uh, was able to deal with their mail might have the mail piling up. Uh, cognitive functioning might decrease, in which case people will start forgetting. And the isolation can increase and increase. You might see signs of poor nutrition, uneaten food sitting around. And over time, that person will become more and more isolated, stop going out, stay more within their own four walls. And that leads to more and more decline. So that in itself is a pretty good sign that something is wrong in that person's life. But what if you don't see the person frequently? I mean, you might see them once a week, once a month. How do you kind of grab hold of what's going on? Well, it might take time for you to really notice that, and I think you have to give yourself that, that you're not an ever-present caregiver to this person. So over time, you will see some of these signs. You will see somebody who formerly knew your name, not being able to even recognize you. You might see mail piling up outside the door. You might see signs that things aren't as they were. I've seen that in my own building. I think because here in New York we have kind of a unique situation. We live in apartments and oftentimes you don't know the people in the building unless you've lived there for a long time. But like Reva mentioned, you know, you can see people, you get on the elevator with them and suddenly they're walking with a cane or they don't look so well or you hear they've been in the hospital. And I would say that usually, certainly in my building, people, there are certain people who will always go and check up on the person or see if they need something. But um, it is difficult and it is a challenge. Well, I just had something really nice happen to me today. I would send out jokes or information on the internet and one of my friends, she sent me an email and she said, you know, busy, going back to everybody busy, leading their own lives, you see people, you don't see people. She said, are you okay? 
And I thought, wow, that was really terrific. Uh, yeah. You know, it was like, okay, that's a big sign right there that you're not sending out emails like you did before. What's going on? You know, I think uh, an important thing to do is to keep your friendships and your acquaintances, you know, keep in touch with them. I think we are so busy all the time that we lose track of, you know, our closest friends. We have to make appointments to see them. And it's important to That's keep That's a very good point that. also because as you get older, those social networks can be a lifeline. They can be a lifeline to helping you recognize that things aren't as they were. They can be a lifeline to services, to intellectual stimulation. One of the signs of social isolation is when people do not have those social networks. And one of the things that I think we're all trying to do is build new ones for people. But on a preventive level, as you were saying, Sheila, you have to keep those networks going. If it weren't for networks, there would be no Share the Care, because that came out of a real-life need right here in New York City. People have a hard time identifying themselves as a caregiver because usually they're taking care of a family member or someone very close so they don't think that that's being a caregiver because that's part of their relationship, part of their duty. I mean, I know I did that with my mom when, when I first became a caregiver. It was like uh, my life revolved around my mother and I became one of those depressed, burnt-out caregivers because I just put everything into it. I guess it's kind of like, uh, how do you figure out what to do, how to do it, because you're so involved and wrapped up, and you're like, okay, like you said, you're burnt out, you're so wrapped up, you don't know where to go for help. So before we get to how do you go for help, how do you get involved in somebody's care if you're not a family member? It's on what your prior relationship has been with them. I think it's very hard to enter into someone's life at a point where they're feeling so vulnerable. You have to establish a sense of trust, and that takes time. And over time, they will start to confide in you. They might express some issues that they're having um, and some of the fears that they're experiencing. But until that point, all you can do is make suggestions in a very, very gentle way. You can say, would you like me to call such and such an agency, and they can call you with your permission and tell you about some of the programs and services they have. But until that person has told you that they're willing to have that kind of intervention, you really are in a very peripheral role. And you also have to think about being realistic. And how much do you want to get involved? You talked earlier about your busy life. And you cannot come in and fix a situation that really has so many components to it. So you have to go slow. And you have to be very careful about what you yourself are willing to do. You have to really ask yourself that question. Well, what are the legal ramifications? Well, you don't want to get involved in too much legal stuff with somebody. Um, but for yourself, I think you would fall under the Good Samaritan law of somebody who's just a friend. Now, again, it depends on how involved you get, which is why we always urge people to call resources and services and get advice for yourself. In other words, if you call a social service agency and explain the situation, the person at the other end of the phone is most likely to be able to tell you some things that you might do or you might do in conjunction with them. They don't say that they need help, but you know they need help. Where do you, you walk in a tightrope here. Mm -hmm. Well, usually it takes a crisis, okay? That's how Share the Care actually began. I had a friend who had a bout with cancer. She went for treatment. She was a divorced mother, two teenage daughters, a big high-powered job with a Fortune 500 company. She's diagnosed with a lump behind her ear that turns out to be cancer of the parotid gland. She goes in for uh, surgery, radiation, all of that, and uh, she carries on with her life for four years 
with a little bit of help from her friend, yours truly here, until she reaches a real crisis. And actually, uh, she had been through several more bouts of cancer, but like many people who are ill, she kept it a secret. It's like, I don't know what it is about, about people being ill, but they don't want anybody to know. They want to take care of it themselves. They want to be Superman or Superwoman. But when she reached out and asked her friends for help, everything changed. And that's a good point about the fact that people want to maintain their independence. A lot of older women say to us, all my life I was the one who gave care. I really don't need any, quote, charity. Uh, there's a real sense of embarrassment about it and a lot of denial, as you were saying, that you even need the help. Actually, I think people want to help, but getting the person who's ill or, you know, injured or whatever and their family to accept help is the biggest issue. It's the hardest thing to do. But once they agree and let you help them, they are so happy to have the support and love of their friends and neighbors. And, and that's what the Share the Care model is about. It's about organizing the people. They actually organize themselves to run and maintain themselves so they can do whatever the family or the care recipient needs. Well, let's go to care, share the care. It started because you said you had a friend who was sick. You just went through right. this and you started. How did you pull a group together? Well, actually, I have to say it was her therapist who she was seeing who said to Susan after four years, Susan, call your friends, get them together. We're going to have a meeting in my office tomorrow night and we'll figure out what to do. She called up 15 people and 12 of us showed up in less than 24 hours notice. And that was a real turning point because it was the first time all of her friends who didn't know each other, because they were co-workers, neighbors, uh, friends, other moms, all in a room together. I knew two people. I knew my co-author, Cappy Capicella, and I knew one other woman besides Susan. The rest were total strangers. But that night was phenomenal because we became bonded, we figured out how to work, and we got started the next day because we had to, because we wanted to. So, so how do you pull the okay? You pulled the group together. You um, divided the chores. You did well. It, it's it's a little more complicated than that. That's why we put it down on paper. We took care of Susan for four and a half years, actually three and a half years until she passed away, and it wasn't until a friend of hers, who she had met at cancer care, and told them about her funny family, as we used to call ourselves, that we got a call from this woman who was in a similar circumstance. And in teaching this other group of her friends what to do and how to do it, we were inspired to put it down on paper. So it wasn't about doing it as much as teaching it and seeing how people relaxed once they had a plan. Well, we're all busy. How do you fit in caregiving for an individual. When I was a caregiver for my friend Susan, by this time my mother went into the nursing home because I had no other option for her. She really needed 24-hour care. While I was helping Susan, I was still my mother's caregiver. I went back to work, which I wasn't doing when I was taking care of my mother, and I had a social life. It was possible because I wasn't trying to do everything. I was doing a little piece. So basically what you're saying is don't try to do it all. Exactly. Get people to help. And I think one of the problems is, because I was a caregiver for a friend in the hospital, and it was like nobody tells you things until after the fact when it doesn't help you. So where do you really go to find out what services are available? Uh, well, actually, here in New York, you can call 311. And they have a roster of social service agencies and will direct you to the one that will be most helpful to you. So that really has, is an improvement over what we had before. And there are luckily many social service agencies 
and we are looking for new models such as Sheila's and others to see how we can keep people in their homes reduce the stress of the family caregiver and make sure that person is as safe as comfortable as possible grew up in New York your parents are still here one is passed away one is still living and you live in another part of the country what can you do and you can't keep going back and forth mm -hmm. what services or what's available or what do you do to get care for your your mother or your father well there's a new profession a relatively new profession geriatric care management mm -hmm. and that would be for an elderly person uh, so there are many long-distance caregivers, and a geriatric ma care manager takes over the role that you can no longer play because of the distance, goes in, does an assessment, knows all the resources, is in communication with you as well as the older person, and puts those things into place with your approval as the caregiver. And so you're getting reports back and forth as well. Well, do you have the legal right to do this? What's the legal ramifications of a parent well, saying, you know, you know? There are responsibilities as far as children are concerned. There are no responsibilities legally as far as uh, an adult parent, a parent is concerned. And so what you are is the next of kin. What you hope is that at the time when your parent is still competent and able, they have given you power, um, power of attorney, which takes care of your financial matters, but even more importantly, a health care proxy, which allows you to make health care decisions in the event that the older person isn't capable themselves. That's very true. Also, if you have a network of friends and neighbors, they become your family. A lot of people have no family. That's, that's, that's you know, another issue. The other thing that I think is important for people out there to, to understand is that we are going to need an awful lot of caregivers in the future because we don't, we're not going to have enough professionals to take care of everybody in the next 20, 30 years when the aging population doubles. So that's, it's important for all of us to start thinking about uh, how we can help other people, what we can do for them, or how letting people help you, because we have to learn how to be caregivers. We have to be prepared. All right, let's start with that. How do we prepare ourselves today for us in 10, 20 years from now? What do we have to start doing just talking about the two um, models uh, that we were both describing, you need a lot of friends. You need, you, it, it's better if you have good friends who can help you, so you have a strength in social network. But in Sheila's model, they don't even have to be very good friends. No, they can be your coworkers, acquaintances, neighbors, uh, people from clubs that you belong to. I mean, there have been groups that have over 100 people taking care of someone. I know of m many groups that have been quite large that have kept someone at home for over six years. There's even a group I'm in communication with that has transitioned their friend who was living on their own and with, with their help to a nursing home because she's no longer able to live on her own, but they haven't stopped their caregiving. They continue visiting her in the hospice, and in fact, the hospice people are so interested in what they're doing that they want to have a meeting with them. So it's, it's a mindset that this country, you know, the, the world actually, because Share the Care is in a lot of other countries. I just heard from one in Australia today, so that was kind of neat. But it's, it's about overcoming the unwillingness to really step forward and offer help and the unwillingness to accept help. We all have to come somewhere in the middle because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And there are, uh, in development, a lot of different models. There are 
villages mm -hmm. where people live independently in their own homes, but they have a membership and they run the organization themselves, but they also have access to home care and other resources that they might need. Uh, and they have people they can rely on in order to research and make sure that those are vetted resources for them. You're saying get your friends, get your neighbors, your co-workers involved in your nucleus. Does everybody have to have a certain type of a role? Because not everybody can, is good with yes. one thing. Yes. Not everybody is good with finances or changing, I was going to say changing diapers, or ch giving medication or stuff like that. How do you judge or what kind of people are you looking for in your group? Okay. Well, a, a group, first of all, is not started by the care recipient or the family. That's number one. They have enough to worry about. Two of their friends or people who really want to help them will take on the role of organizing the first meeting, which is totally laid out step by step. Share the Care has a special meeting where everybody gets together. It's kind of a replica of that very first night. But the two people will sit with the family and the care recipient to figure out who to invite and really dig hard and think of all the people that you normally wouldn't ask, but you might be very surprised that sometimes people you least expected step forward with flying colors and others who you expect are going to do something run for the hills. You know, it's anything can happen. But they will figure out with you who to invite to the meeting and what kind of help is needed. That's something that people often don't think about. But if you know ahead of time what kind of help you're looking for, then people in the meeting are going to be able to choose and pick the jobs they feel comfortable doing, they want to do, that they're good at doing. Because there is so much gold in a group of people because they come with caregiving experience, they come with connections, they come with, uh, you know, just certain talents that make such uh, a wonderful experience out of helping. Uh, it's one of the most incredible life-changing experiences I have had, and that one plays back to me all the time from other groups. It changed their lives helping someone working together. It makes you realize how vulnerable you are to your health and your situation. Well, we all start looking oh, yeah. at our, what are we doing with our lives when we're helping a close friend who's ill or aging or, you know, it also could be a group to help. We've had groups for quadruplets, uh, groups for widowers or a widow left with small children that need support, grandparents raising small children. I mean, the only thing that limits what you can do is the imagination. It's just a question of people finding a way to make it happen and maintain it. Because I, I noticed in your book you talk, you have charts and you have schedules and, I mean, it was like phenomenal. It's like you're running a corporation is basically what you're doing. It's really simple. It's just that it's all laid out for you, and it looks overwhelming, but everything is quite simple. Um, it's just a way of thinking about it, a philosophy, a way of caregiving. And uh, there are lots of checks and balances throughout the lifetime of a group because Oftentimes, when there's a change with the person who needs the help, maybe they're getting better or maybe they're getting worse in terms of their health, the group has to adjust. They either have to stop doing as much or start doing more or differently. And we have seven principles that help keep a group running. What are the seven principles? Well, some of them are uh, rotating responsibilities are key to not burning out and uh, keeping your own life in good working order. And also supporting each other in the group is very important. So there are, you know, there are things that can help everyone, but um, we also point out times when it's important to regroup 
for that second meeting, not only to adjust, but also for your emotional issues, you know, to talk about them and just reconnect and get tighter, especially if someone is in the late stages of life. Then you're really bonding with everybody. Our little group was a bunch of strangers. By the end, we were sisters. That's for you know, I'm also thinking what a terrific benefit it is to the family caregiver, if there is one. Because, as you were saying before, that person just doesn't know where to turn, what to do. If they take on too much, their health is compromised, they, their financial situation is compromised yes. because maybe they're not able to go to work anymore. Mm -hmm. So that you're supporting the caregiver as well as the person in that situation. The whole family, actually. The whole family. The whole exactly. family of their children or aging people. It's about taking care of the whole little family because everybody's hurting. So it, it is, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. I guess one of the things I'm thinking about in this conversation is that we really have to reduce barriers, uh, eliminate barriers would be even better, yeah. to people getting help, to the help being available and people being able to accept the help. Um, in so many situations, people, as you said, don't know where to turn, and I think that uh, we need more geriatricians, we need more professionals, but we also need more people who are willing to do the kind of work that Sheila's talking about. I probably, you know, just listen to this, I think people don't realize what's, what can be done because they're so stressed on the situation that they find themselves in that they don't know where to turn, what to do, and it's kind of like, okay, What's out there? You know, it's not being educated about things like this. And it's almost like there should be a class in school, in college, to know what's available to people if you ever find yourself in a situation. Well, I think there are, are classes like that now. I also wanted to mention that even though I was talking about a group of women with the first group, that just happened to be how it was, but men are caregivers all the time, as are children. I mean, Everybody has something to give. I don't care how old you are. Everybody in the family should be involved. Little children can feed the dog or go get the mail out of the mailbox. It's, it's very important not to isolate children from, from people who are ill or aging because it's a natural part of life. You know, we have, as part of our volunteer program, we have children volunteering. And we match them and their families very often with um, seniors who are isolated in the community and so look forward to having mm -hmm. anybody of that age with whom they can communicate. And some people adore young children, some people love teenagers, and some people just want adults. But when we have that opportunity, mm -hmm. it also instills in those children a sense of responsibility and volunteerism. And we think that's really important. What do you see happening down the pike? What's coming down? I know you mentioned we've got to get this caregiving more out and broadcast it, that you have options. I think it, I think it will happen. I think because of the state of the country, the world, the economy, you know, a lot of services are, are going out of business, so to speak. So I think it's going to be up to us as citizens, as people, to, to start um, filling in the gaps or taking charge of our own issues when it's possible. Now, share the care groups cannot do what the health professionals can do, but they can do all the things they can't do, which are plenty. And because they know the family, they're, they're miles ahead of anybody else in terms of bringing a better quality of life to them. And that brings us back to the whole issue of prevention, of helping people to accept help, of helping people to have a large circle of acquaintances and friends that can help them throughout the lifespan, making new friends, young friends. And also, I think it's going to be more and more important for us to be able to bring services to people in their homes, whether it's 
through teleconference calls where they can have a community of people with whom they socialize and have intellectual stimulation, whether it's the internet, which a lot of old people are actually mm -hmm. very interested in learning um, to use. We have a small meals program that delivers meals uh, frozen meals to people who are in emergency situations, uh, but again, it's geographically limited to a certain place because there are financial limitations. So in that sense, there, there are gaps. There are lots of different kinds of gaps. How do you get the word out about caregiving? I mean, we're here in New York. How do we broadcast this, what other people can do? Well, our organization, Share the Caregiving, is grassroots. A lot of it is spread by word of mouth. You'd be surprised how many people uh, who have been in groups go on to help other people start groups, even care recipients. I got a call from this woman a few months ago asking me something about the forms. So I said to her, how did you learn about Share the Care? And she said, well, I had a Share the Care group for me because I had breast cancer. And then she said, I went into a mission, and now I'm starting the fourth group for somebody else. I was blown away. I mean, that is priceless. That is like the gold. But um, the way our organization works is we are about education, so I do a lot of trainings for health professionals and clergy in communities all over the country. In fact, I just did uh, the beginning of a pilot in Monterey County in California at the beginning of the year. And that way I can reach 50 to 60 professionals in one training and they can go and let their patients and families know about Share the Care and, you know, give them the beginning steps and, you know, give them the encouragement to consider using the model. There are other organizations that deal with specific illnesses or chronic conditions, such as the Alzheimer's Association, Cancer Care, facilitate a group of caregivers who are taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's disease. And the Alzheimer's Association has hundreds of these going out throughout the city and abroad, I think, abroad meaning outside of New York. And they publicize these. They have a very strong educational forum for caregivers where people can come in and learn about financial issues, communication issues, and be oriented so that they have a starting point and they're always invited to join a support group. And the support groups go on for a very, very long time and provide that mutuality that people need in order to feel normalized in how they feel and how they're reacting and what kinds of issues they're facing. And so they share resources and they share ways of coping and it keeps people resilient. So those are all important venues for both education and support. Actually, when I first became a caregiver for my mom in the mid 80s, there was nothing out there for anybody who was being a caregiver that I know of. In fact, I think in the last 15 years, there have been so many programs and organizations and ways of helping caregivers that it's incredible. It's, it's wonderful. And, and like Reva mentioned, they are specific to certain types of illness, so you really get the support and help and information that you need because if you're going to be a caregiver you should learn everything you can about that person's condition so that you can help them uh, make the best choices and decisions. At Der Road we're able to do this through our teleconferencing classes. We have uh, classes about health, we have classes about the various conditions, things like how to talk to your doctor, and we have a special component for caregivers. We know that they are very often unable to get away from their desks, to get away from the person they're giving care to. So these telephone discussion groups allow them to take time off for, let's say, 50 minutes and get that kind of education, get the support of other people, and ask the kinds of hard questions that they may not have anybody else else in their lives to ask. What are some of the hard questions that need to be asked and addressed to make sure that the person is getting the best care and you know you're doing the best you can? 
I think that varies. There's a huge spectrum. For some people, it's how do I deal with the stress? I'm so stressed out, I can't be a good caregiver to the person I'm taking care of. How can I reduce that stress? So there might be a discussion about ways to alleviate the stress by taking exercise classes, by taking a walk, just by taking a break. It could be about how do I hire a home care worker? What kinds of questions do I need to ask? What kind of monitoring do I need to do along the way? The, as you said, if you're new to this, it's a big open world with a lot of questions. It's so useful to talk to other people who are going through this themselves and find out how they've done it. I just add on to that, sure. taking care of yourself while you're a caregiver is critical. It's like when you're on the plane and they say before you try to help the person next to you put on your own oxygen mask. It applies doubly to a caregiver because what happens when that caregiver gets ill themselves? Then everything goes to pieces. Uh, just to cite how the group thing works, there was a group in Colorado. 80 people helping a woman, woman with uh, MS. Her husband, who had been her sole caregiver for the past 20 years, ended up in the hospital for three weeks himself with a very serious condition. Fortunately, she had those people there to take care of her. We never know when we, the caregiver, could get ill. And Caregivers really need to be reminded that they need to take time off, that they need to take care of themselves, because even though it sounds very simplistic, they often do not do that, and they don't take the breaks that they need. When they're in a support group, this, the group allows them permission, gives them permission, encourages them to do that kind of self-care, and also provides opportunities where they can see a different model, it, it has somebody else's coping with the situation, things will resonate around the room so that other people will understand a new way of coping and adapting. So groups really together give that kind of support that people don't have in the other parts of their lives. That's very important. I think that's important in all aspects of our lives. Too. Yeah, that's right. What else do you find that there's like a hole in the whole system that needs to be rectified as, you know, um, going forward. Well, I think from the perspective of working with the elderly, there's still a lot of ageism in this country. Uh, we see and respect people who are self-sufficient, who are independent, and we don't recognize that interdependence is as important and as vital as independence. So I think our attitudes need to be changed. I think we need to understand that this is probably going to happen to all of us if we're lucky, mm -hmm. and that we need to value older people, we need to validate who they are, and there are many ways we can do that. If the community is really interested, it can be done. What are some of the ways that an elderly person can be validated? Well, for example, if you have somebody who is visiting you and you tell your life story, it is of immeasurable value to a young person who's grappling with their own situation and trying to figure out what their own life trajectory is going to be. For an older person, having a younger person visit them and talk about what's happening in their lives is an opportunity they wouldn't have otherwise. So the community needs to bring those people together, needs to make that happen. And that, I think, is what we need to do. We need to look at all the modalities available to us, technology and the simple human act of compassion, and harness that for the good of our generation and those that will follow us. I mean, with the baby boomers coming, mm -hmm. we really have a major issue on our hands. And as you know, um, Alzheimer's disease is yet uncurable. We need to be on the lookout for that. We need to understand that better. We need to understand how we can bring the community to bear on people who have that disease. So we have a lot of homework to do. It sounds like a never-ending process, and we're just beginning in this whole cycle of life. It's yeah. The last third of the, our lives have 
needing to go back to some of the values that we used to have in this country that seem to have gotten lost in the shuffle. And that is like, you know, helping out your neighbor, the barn raising concept. And also with technology, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time, because in many ways it brings us together in our homes, but it takes us further apart from getting together in person. That's why um, having community really involved with each other is so vital and important. Um, and you're talking about the movement toward volunteerism, that it's our responsibility and it's also a privilege. We consider our volunteers as privileged people and that it's an honor to serve in that way. But that's a message we need to get across more widely as well so that we will have those personal resources to come and assist older people as they age in place, hopefully, for as long as they can. It is a, a great thing to volunteer and it is also one of the most rewarding things you can ever do. It comes back to you a thousandfold. You know, there's no other way of explaining that except that. And that's very important also for the person you're helping to know that you as the volunteer or the group member or the person helping them is getting something back. So they don't feel guilty about accepting that help. It's, it's a two-way street. So it's a gift they are giving you as a volunteer or a caregiver to allow you to help them. We all live in apartment buildings basically here in Manhattan. There are some areas that do have caregiving groups. How do they get started or what's the first thing to do? Do you talk to the board? Do you talk to the superintendent? How do you pull something together when you don't need it so that when it's needed, it's there? Well, there are areas and buildings here in New York that are called NORCs, that's Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. And these are people who may have bought or rented their apartments 40 years ago, maybe even longer, and they're all aging in. One example that we've been involved in is where the, uh, the building itself has a board, and that board hires assistants to bring services and help to that agent community. And so we can go in and do assessments, we can provide friendly visiting, and we, can, we have birthday parties, we have doctors and nurses coming in to give lectures and to do education, and so that the opportunities are all there in that one place. So people don't have to go out in the bad weather, it's easily accessible, and they're meeting their own neighbors, so they become another support group for themselves. Sounds like I should move. <laughs> <laughs> These are developing. This it's is like fantastic. a village in a building. Right, mm -hmm. right. In the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? I think we need to start viewing aging as a wonderful transition in life and not as a series of infirmities. I, need, I think we need to understand the value that older people can bring to the community, to one another, to younger people, and, and make sure that we take advantage of that and to treat these people with the respect and the dignity that they deserve. And I think as we look to the future, we have to be creative in the kinds of services and programming that we provide. I would just like to say to anyone out there who is a caregiver or who may be a caregiver or who's thinking about being a caregiver, please get help. Do not attempt to do it all on your own and carry the burden all on your own. It's, it's one of the hardest jobs in the world, quite frankly, mm -hmm. to, to care for someone because your whole life is put on hold when you're doing that and you need to do everything you can to care for them, but also keep your own life working and keep your own relationships going. Um, so I can only say that my whole life changed because of caregiving. And most 
dramatically probably in 2002 when the woman that I co-authored the book Share the Care with, Cappy Capicella, who was also a friend of mine for 30 years, and we worked together in advertising as a creative team. She and her father were both stricken with uh, brain cancer at the same time. And ironically, uh, 33 of us rallied around Cappy to care for her for 10 months before she died. And that experience was so powerful and so poignant and so moving to me that I knew that having done this caregiving now three times, that getting word out about Share the Care was was going to be my mission. And that's why I started the organization. So it is a very, very beautiful experience and one that uh, you can't take lightly. But there's great love and there's great compassion and there's so much that people have to give. It brings out the very best in every single one of us. And um, I hope people will consider it if they're going to be a caregiver. Thank you both for joining me today. It's been wonderful. I learned so much about caregiving, and I hope you in the audience have learned something about caregiving and that you're not alone, and there are a lot of resources out there for you. Love to hear from you. If you have any questions, just write us here at The Woman's Connection, and we'll be glad to get the answer for you. Bye now.